Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next episode in our podcast series on infrared technologies. Today, we will be doing a deep dive into infrared detectors. Uh, my name is Gary Spingarn. I am product manager here at Hamamatsu for infrared devices, which includes infrared detectors, LEDs, and quantum cascade lasers. Uh, with me today, I have Columbine Robinson. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Columbine? Hi, Gary. Happy to be here. My name is Columbine Robinson, and I'm an applications engineer here at Hamamatsu. I received my master's in condensed matter physics, in which we grew semiconductor crystals and studied their properties, much like the crystals we're about to discuss. So Columbine, since you have a physics background, uh, do you care to explain what infrared light is? I'd be happy to. So infrared light is electromagnetic radiation with lengths longer than that of visible light. This means it's invisible to the human eye. It basically covers anywhere from 700 nanometers to one millimeter. You may be wondering what it can be used for. So one application that we're going to talk about is gas detection. Gases actually absorb infrared light at specific wavelengths, which can then be used to identify what gases you have. This wavelength region is typically referred to as the fingerprint region. We can also use infrared light information in IR spectroscopy to probe molecules and identify them. One challenge though, is that because everything gives off infrared light, it's hard to identify the signal you want to look at from the background. So now Gary, do you wanna explain a little bit how we can detect infrared light? Uh, I sure can. Uh, there are a variety of different technologies uh, one can use to detect infrared light, uh, some of which are similar to a typical photodiode. Uh, however, there are different mechanisms at play in different technologies, uh, starting with which there are thermal detectors, which is a very popular choice. They rely on absorbing radiation, and this creates a temperature differential. Uh, this change in temperature in turn creates electrical signal or voltage. Then there is a photonic technology, uh, which works a bit differently. Uh, as infrared light uh, hits the active material, there are free electrons that in turn provide the electrical signal. Uh, this is all due to characteristics and band gap energy. Uh, so since there's a lot of physics going on here, uh, Columbine, can you give us an explanation of what's going on with thermal detectors? Yeah, so pyroelectric detectors have crystals that have a rare asymmetry due to their single polar axis. This causes their polarization to change with temperature. Therefore, the crystals produce an electrical signal when there is a temperature differential. There are also thermopiles, which generate a voltage when dissimilar metals, also called thermocouples, are exposed to temperature differences. They rely on the Seebeck effect to create this voltage. Bolometers use materials with temperature dependence electrical resistance. Uh, can you give us some specific examples of photonic technology? So photon detectors are materials which have charge carriers, which then interact with mm -hmm. light, which leads to the formation of an electrical signal. The three main alloy compositions are lead detectors, mercury cadmium telluride, also known as MCTs, and INASB. So Gary, can you tell us how someone might make a selection? Uh, great question, and there's actually uh, no short answer. Uh, the choice for a photonic sensor will depend on the wavelength desired for the measurement. Uh, however, there is going to be overlap between the choices, and then there are other factors to consider. Uh, some of the common ones are D-star or detectivity, uh, linearity, speed, and consideration uh, for cooling. Uh, a lot of the background info on this goes back to the physics. So Columbine, can you break them down for us a little bit? Sure. So D-star, also known as detectivity, is a unit used to compare the sensitivity of different types of detectors, as well as the same detector type with different active areas. It takes into account the active area, temperature or wavelength of the radiant source, the chopping frequency, and the bandwidth of the detector. NEP is the amount of signal required to achieve a signal-to-noise ratio of 1. Ultimately, you want as high of a signal-to-noise ratio as possible. D star is the reciprocal of NEP, so the higher the value, the better. So now for linearity, when looking at the sensitivity of a detector, a certain amount of detected light power will yield a certain amount of signal. Ideally, the relationship between incident power and signal is linear so that no software correction is required and tools can be matched. Speed or frequency response is simply the rise time of the detector, 
usually in the form of how long it takes for the signal to go from zero to the peak output. Sometimes data sheets will list frequency response, which is dependent on rise time. Pooling will increase DSTAR by lowering the noise floor, but it's important to remember that pooling will drive up cost, size, and power consumption. Gary, can you give some examples of when these specifications are important? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, starting uh, with DSTAR or T-Deftivity, uh, probably the number one figure of merit for infrared detectors. In general, it's higher the better. Uh, as you mentioned before, it is a reciprocal. So, of course, the higher it is, the more sensitive it is. Uh, essentially, it's going to put less pressure on other components in the system. Uh, a specific example is cavity ring down spectroscopy. Uh, in this configuration, uh, a, a effectively a very long path length is created. So the signal light is very, very low. Uh, in turn, this requires a much higher D-star in order to make the application feasible. Uh, next comes linearity. Uh, in general, uh, spectroscopy relies on a very linear detector. Uh, it, that's the only way to properly apply Beer's law. Uh, the amount of signal should directly correlate to the amount of incident light, uh, establishing a linear relationship. Uh, if we reach a power region uh, that brings us into nonlinear performance for the detector, uh, the measurement will become much more challenging as this is going to introduce a lot of noise, especially in applic uh, spectroscopy applications. Uh, next comes speed. Um, some detectors simply are going to have a signal drop off at higher frequencies. Uh, the problem here is that some IR light sources uh, are going to operate a high frequency modulation. So if one is using one of these light sources, one needs to uh, choose a detector that can keep pace. Uh, next comes with cooling. Of course, uh, cooling provides all sorts of performance benefits, a higher D-star and shunt resistance, and a lot of things you were talking about, Columbine. And as you also mentioned, the extra cost and complexity. It's going to be bigger. Uh, thermoelectric elements are a fixed cost, and there's really no way around that. Uh, so uh, one needs to think about, does the design and application allow for this extra bulkiness and costs? Uh, typically, uh, portable instruments are not a feasible place uh, for cool detectors. So going back to uh, thermal and photonics, which is a very common question I run into, now that we know what performance specifications uh, people should look at, uh, Columbine, can you give us a high level description of how these technologies uh, compare? Yeah, sure. So if we're comparing thermal versus thermal, the main choices are thermopiles and pyroelectric. Some things to take into consideration when designing a system is that thermopiles can be DC coupled, whereas pyroelectric detectors typically are AC coupled, which requires a more complex setup. Another thing to take into consideration is that thermopiles have a flat sensitivity curve across the mid infrared wavelength region, whereas for pyroelectric detectors, their D star varies with wavelength, but is generally higher. They both tend to have low cutoff frequencies. Now, comparing thermal detectors to photonic detectors, in general, photonic detectors are much faster than thermal and commonly provide a higher D star, especially with cooling. However, Room temperature photonic detectors are hard to manage due to the noise floor. Thermopiles are best in applications like human temperature measurements. Pyroelectric detectors are used when a wide wavelength range much be, must be reached without cooling, and photonic detectors are commonly used for analytical applications. One thing to note is that thermal detectors are cheaper. Now, comparing photonic detectors, MCTs generally have a higher D star, However, we've seen a lot of unit to unit variability. If a customer is doing any kind of tool matching, this could lead to an overall hit in sensitivity. Additionally, they're quite expensive and therefore tend to have smaller active areas because of this. They are also no longer Rojas compliant. This is true of lead detectors as well. Lead detectors on the surface may look attractive due to their high D-star, but are very affected by ambient changes in temperature. And the only way to mitigate this is with cooling, which adds cost, bulk, and complexity. And ASB, on the other hand, can operate at room temperature. Additionally, it can go up to 14 microns, can be manufactured uniformly, is economical in volume, and is Rojas compliant. So that's a lot of product detail. Care to share any market developments, Gary? Uh, sure thing. Uh, first and foremost, we recognize that uh, cost has been a hurdle uh, 
uh, for infrared detectors. Uh, now there are options available in surface mount device packaging. Uh, and this allows for a room temperature operation and big cost benefits at, at higher volume. Uh, gone are the days of, of bulky cans uh, and required cooling. There are now detectors readily available in convenient uh, small form factor that are ready for high volume. Uh, next comes back illumination. Uh, as we previously discussed and Columbine mentioned, uh, photonic detectors uh, have a noise floor and then there is variance introduced through temperature changes. Uh, through a proprietary structure, Hamamatsu now offers detectors with back illumination. Uh, this brings the temperature factor from 0.9% change in sensitivity per degree Celsius to 0.1%. So again, 0.9% per degree Celsius uh, to 0.1. Uh, this is truly an innovation and will definitely open doors to new applications, uh, especially in portable instruments, especially because they require those small form factors and no cooling. Uh, next up thing I'd like to mention is the type 2 super lattice. Now, an ASB on its own cannot go past 10 micron due to its physical characteristics and band gap. However, through a proprietary layering scheme of active material, uh, much like you would think of with a quantum cascade laser, now the physical characteristics can change, and we provide a detector uh, that is an MCT that can go out to 14 micron. Uh, we now have a model available uh, with liquid nitrogen cooling, and again, there is now a true alternative to the MCT at longer wavelengths. Uh, so that is pretty much what we got going on in terms of infrared detectors. Uh, that about wraps it, out, wraps it up for us. I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. Thank you for tuning in. We will also be listing our emails here below, myself and Columbine. Uh, feel free to reach out to us with any comments or questions or any thoughts you may have about applications that you're working on. Hopefully you're walking away with a, a better picture of infrared detectors and how to select one. Uh, thank you so much for watching.